All right, how's my hair? Terrible? All right, cool. Uh, Fight for... Fuck, where's the movie? Shit, dick. Fight for Your Life is a home invasion thriller from 1977, the year of Star Wars and the Son of Sam, baby. It's also, by some accounts, incredibly racist. Let's talk about that. So quick plot deets. Uh, our story follows three groups, a trio of racially diverse criminals headed by Jesse Lee Kane, who have by sheer luck escaped a police van, a play by the rules detective, and the local cop there to help him find the escapees, and finally, a black pastor and his family, whose only crime is being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, when Kane and company uh, take the family hostage, it's time for patriarch Ted Turner. <laughs> yep. Uh, to step up and face down this maniacal cracker once and for all. Now, William Sanderson is undoubtedly the main draw here. Despite solid performances from the victimized characters, his debut lead role as Kane is far removed from his more famous gigs. Uh, J.F. Sebastian in Blade Runner, E.B. Farnham in Deadwood, potentially other characters with two initials at the top of their name. Uh, who in the hell are you coming in here giving us orders? I'm the law, as long as I got this thing. You're playing a ruthless, hate-filled super racist. I say any of you black-ass coons hungry, and you're supposed to say, yes, master, us black-ass coons is all hungry. Now you got that? Dude's a bald cap and a bastardized symbol of faith away from curb stomping his way back to prison. Apparently Sanderson was so adamant that he was right for the part that he stayed at the casting office all day while other actors auditioned until director Robert A. Endelson told him he had the part. Um, which I guess paid off. And y'all just sit there like brown dirt balls on a fender. Uh, Sanderson didn't return for the commentary track years later due to not wanting to be seen as this particular asshole racist character, but, you know, whatever. He kills it. Uh, not the most subtle performance, and by no means even the best home invasion villain performance, but still a memorable bad guy whom you can't wait to see get his comeuppance. What's the matter? Nobody hungry? Uh, at the center of this excursion into poor taste is the educated black family that is perhaps uh, maybe a little bit overwritten to be emphatically black. Uh, hell, you even get framed pictures of MLK and the Kennedys on their wall. It's, it, it, it's a bit much at times, but nothing out of left field in this genre, and I don't think it ever really uh, goes into the point of just being a stereotype. I still think they feel like real characters. Strength isn't everything. The Lord said the meat shall inherit this earth. Amen. I'll tell you where it's at. Black power. That's where it's at. That's right, Granny. Black power. Right on. It's perhaps a little heavy-handed, but that doesn't really hurt anything here. Uh, they're not unbelievable, just very directly written. And, uh, and hey, w would it not make the most sense to write your black family as quintessentially black as possible when they're inevitably going to face the most overtly racist character possible? Fuck balls. Ah, da, 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 da. Hit my hand, hit my hand, hit my hand. Wisely, writer Straw Wiseman uh, includes plenty of melting pot diversity throughout. Uh, the kiddo has a white friend, the family is apparently friendly with the white liquor store owner, etc. Uh, more important than all that is their relatability and likability. Now, I admittedly don't have any connection to black families of the 1970s due to the whole not being alive, for one thing, but uh, to me, the Turners come off as incredibly kind, smart, and good-natured, something I, I wouldn't place too much emphasis on here if it weren't for, again, uh, that idea that this film is inherently racist. I just, I don't know, I don't see it. I don't, I don't see it, guys. I don't, I don't see it. Fight for Your Life is playful at times. Uh, this sequence wherein Karen, the white friend of the family, dreams of or perhaps flashes back to a softly lit sensual meetup with her dead lover, the son of the Turners who died in a car accident, is uh, delightfully schmaltzy. Her inclusion here is a little more than TNA mandated by producer William Mishkin for one of the film's more horrific sequences. Uh, right after the humorous love montage is this line. I need a white for dinner. Obviously there is some, uh, pardon the pun, black humor on display in this home invasion thriller. Uh, at the same time, there is more than a fair amount of cruelty. 
uh, an exploitative, nihilistic edge that you'd expect from a film with such a strong divide amongst viewers. Right after the white for dinner line, uh, no doubt written to get a chuckle out of the knowing audience, Kane shoots the liquor store owner in the chest right in front of his infant child, and again, at least partially to poke at the audience as well as the characters in attendance, he places the gun at the head of the baby and pulls the trigger. Jesus fucking Christ. Luckily for everyone, audience included, it's a bluff and the gun's empty, but you know, still, there's, <laughs> that's some brass balls work, uh, at work there. Like, even within the context of a William Mishkin produced exploitation joint, to threaten a baby in such direct fashion, like, just look at the poor thing, fuck. Uh, and minor spoilers, it also might have been added to give a perverse comfort to the audience uh, before other extreme acts of violence. Now, upon arriving at the home of our innocent black family, Kane immediately starts throwing around epithets and a manic southern sleaze energy. Jesse Lee Kane, pleased to meet you, nigger. The sheer amount of hardcore racism emitted by Kane gets to a point very early on, like literally around the 25 minute mark, that it's almost parody. I wouldn't call it particularly funny parody, but it does feel like a well-acted caricature. As the film goes on though, he does manage to keep a careful balance between the outlandish and the disturbing as he humiliates and tortures this innocent family. Uh, it's worth noting, by the way, that this is, as far as I can tell, the only film to wind up on the video nasty list due entirely to its language. Uh, cause it's bad. <laughs> I'll see if you don't look like you belong there. What are you talking about? You little coon. You the nigger in the wood pile. And you stay there. And when the pervert and Chino get back, I'm gonna put Martin Luther Coon right there next to you. Uh, anyway, for those squeamish to the concept of a black family being abused by some loony racist cracker, I'm specifically avoiding the last third of the film, uh, or at least the last like 20 minutes, uh, where you can probably guess how things turn out for our nefarious trio. Uh, let's just say that by the end credits, uh, I, was, I was pretty convinced that Elson is Anything but a racist, oh boy. Uh, as much glee as he has depicting rape and murder, he displays just as much, if not more, in those last 20 minutes, which gives us a lovely slice of vengeance with a scoop of social commentary. Uh, it's worth noting also the environment uh, in which Fight for Your Life was made. This was exploitation made for the explicit purpose of, well, exploitation. Uh, black cinema was a huge earner, black exploitation movies. Rape and revenge was everywhere, uh, and the audiences wanted their bloodlust satiated. Uh, and Fight for Your Life was written to meet those needs. By all accounts, black audiences specifically had a great time with the movie, presumably due to the blunt presentation of the horrors of racism and acknowledgement that these fuckheads are still out there, and the fact that eventually they would have to meet some sort of grand judgment. Speaking of grand judgment, don't forget to check out my Patreon where you can help me pay bills and make videos. The only thing stopping me from putting out fresh, tasty content multiple times a week is that dang full-time job business. So do your part, buckaroos, and put money into my coffers today. Uh, get exclusive videos, including my Jean Rolin series, just for WTF tier patrons. Get in on fun watch parties with the whole gang. Get behind the scenes junk, and the general feeling of accomplishment when I finally start my own cult. Join the likes of Grant Hudgens, Bill Dowd, Oliver of Grindhouse Chic, Just the Discs, and Ian Wadley. Or pop on up to that sexy boy and spicy cougar club tier with totally sexy MVPs like Blake Bergman. Goat Cat 66, Allison Troy, you cougar, Michael Starlings, and Academy Award nominee Carrie Mulligan. Don't like Patreon? That's cool. You can also help out by giving to my Indiegogo campaign for Dr. Deathface, the beautiful story of a sex therapist in his man eating vagina bed. That ends March 8th, March 8th, March 8th! So hop to it. With that audience exploitation out of the way, back to the normal ex exploit. This movie. We're going to talk. We're talking about this. Now this is by no means a perfect little production, nor should you expect it to be. In keeping with certain other offensive exploitation nasties from the era, the cops on the case are, um, not the bright spot. I get itchy just hanging around here. They aren't as bad as those Keystone fuckwits from Last House on the Left, but they certainly took me out of the film and kinda wind up taking the wind out of the climactic moments. That said, they do serve a purpose thematically, and this Joe Friday wannabe gets a solid arc out of the whole thing, it's just... You know, it feels a bit unnecessary and almost undermines Turner's big moment at the end. Uh, several effects aren't handled particularly well either, probably due to Indelson's relative inexperience and the resources at hand. 
For example, this scene of Kane smacking around Papa Turner with a book is pretty unconvincing, for example, and by today's standards, most of the violence hits as pretty fake. There's also a very silly, needlessly gory death in the tail end that's a little sillier than this movie needs. Extremely minor complaint, but it certainly um, stuck out to me. Taken all together, I can see people reacting poorly more to these low budget issues than the content itself, although that I don't want to undermine just how insanely racist the dialogue is. Like, uh, I don't, you know, now I'm thinking about it, William Sanderson not coming back kind of makes sense. I understand they got the hottest little number just walking around asking for it. Come here, bitch. Holy shit. Like in today's age, fuck that. Now this film could really use a higher resolution image since the grain can be pretty darn chunky, as you can tell. Still finding appreciation even at home, huh, pops? But there's a problem. Uh, the scan used for this disc is standard definition, and per William Lustig, uh, the negative was destroyed while in a New Jersey basement during Hurricane Sandy. Vis-a-vis, -vis, we'll never actually get a chance to see Fight Fear Life in its full glory. There is, of course, always the opportunity uh, a print might turn up or is already being actively restored, but a 4K scan of the negative is sadly not in the cards. So if you'd like to watch it anytime soon, your best bet is this Blue Underground DVD. It's not jam-packed, but the scan is great for SD, and you get a great and informative commentary track with Lustig, Straw Weissman, and cinematographer Lloyd Freitas, uh, who notably gets to talk a bit about lighting on such a teensy budget. And uh, yeah, that's that's all I got for now. Uh, Five for Your Life is a solid little picture and a must-see for anyone with a scholarly love of 70s exploitation. Uh, just don't wait for the Blu-ray. And hey, go watch a movie. Did you say your name was Turd, is that right? Ted. Yeah, Uncle Remus, that's what I thought, Turd.